manifesto of the Communist Party by Marx and Engels for this class. You know, no? We know. You all know it yeah. line by line, right? <laughs> <laughs> sort of, at least the first line. line. Yeah? The first and the last line. <laughs> <laughs> The, the principal reading for this uh, course, unfortunately, because of its subject matter, is this, this book. But I'm not going to assign the book. I'm going to assign 60 pages and try to get it on... Uh, Michael is not here. i try to get it on uh, email and get you all a copy by email of the second chapter, which is the, the chapter that we'll be mostly talking about. But for the moment, uh, I'm going to talk about this course as a, a, in an introductory way. Um, I have been known to say something which you may or may not agree with. And if you do agree with it, that's one thing. If you don't agree with it, we have an interesting conversation on it. But if it's uh, taken for granted, um, in the United States, we have a lot of lefties. I would say a couple of million, at least. But we have no left. And uh, that is a very uh, significant um, f fact that has always um, befuddled the Europeans and the Asians and the Latin Americans about the United States. The most advanced capitalist country in the world by everybody's imagination, even if it's not true. Uh, and it hasn't had a left of any consequence since approximately 1950. And the only left that it had, of course, was the Socialist Party until roughly 1930, and the Communist Party from uh, 1919 when it was formed to 1949 and 50 when the communist trials, the trials of the 12 leaders of the communist party was held and they were all convicted of, nobody knows? What were they convicted of? Sedition. No. No. <laughs> no. If they were convicted of sedition, it would be good. No, yeah. they're good. Yeah. <laughs> then they then you know that there was something there. They wouldn't have need for Dennis versus United but that's States. Not, what were they convicted of? Nothing? Okay. Agents of a foreign government. Conspiracy. Conspiracy. To advocate the overthrow of the government by force and violence. Imagine the phrase conspiracy to advocate. Which means they got together and said, under ideal circumstances, we would like to replace the capitalist system by revolutionary means. Revolution meaning uh, we would seize the White House or seize the main institutions of government and as Marx said about Hegel, turn them upside down. <laughs> That's what they were con convicted of. And one of them was excused, so it was Communist 11. No takers? A minor figure named William Zebulon Foster, who was the chairman of the Communist Party, but he was sick. Um, and anybody who's not well is uh, advised to do what Foster did. He moved to the Bronx, <laughs> where I'm from. Montefiore, huh? He <laughs> lived in the Bronx, yeah, at the end of his life. At the end of his, uh, in 1950, 
he was uh, 70 years old, and he died in 1960 uh, at the age of uh, uh, 80, I guess. Born in, 19, in 1880 in Massachusetts. Um, I think I think I ought to say a word about Foster before we go further. Um, Foster was arguably, without uh, commenting on his own views yet, the uh, most imaginative. Uh, and perhaps the best organized per a leader of the left in its history. And that includes the great figure, Eugene Victor Debs, who was presidential candidate of the Socialist Party uh, several times, the last one being in 1920 when he ran in from jail and uh, gathered a million votes from jail. Um, Debs ran a uh, presidential candidate, traveled the country, was the main publicist that the social that socialism in the co in this country ever had. But he was uh, and he was a uh, a railway um, executive, uh, a union executive. And I use that word deliberately because that's the way they functioned in the uh, late 19th century until he formed with others the American Railway Union, which attempted to bring all the crafts together and succeeded for a while. What made Foster so significant was a small feat. He organized a general strike in steel in 1919, which was, uh, in terms of numbers, successful, but was defeated. And uh, he got the, he didn't organize it outside of the AFL. He organized it inside of the AFL, remarkably convincing Samuel Gompers uh, that it should be done as the, uh, as the main way to organize unionism in, this, in the most important industry at the time in the United States, which was the steel industry. Maybe you don't know the phrase, but there was a phrase at the time, not just for unionism, but for almost anything, which went like this, as steel goes, dot, dot, dot. I worked for 10 years in the steel industry, and even as late as 1960, steel was, at the very least, as important as any industry in terms of public imagination as any industry in this country. And then it fell after 1960, mainly after 1970 on very hard times. U.S. Steel um, changed its name. Um, Bethlehem got smaller. Republic got smaller. Um, and by 1970, as steel goes, that, that, that was no longer others, at any, almost anywhere, because it was broken up the industry was broken up and large parts of it were closed down. What was interesting about it being broken up was that broken up into small, uh, uh, into uh, much smaller um, land masses and, and, and numbers of workers, it still produced the same tonnage of steel as it did in 1960, which was 7 billion tons a year exactly the same amount that the U.S. imported from abroad uh, by 1970, uh, perhaps. Um, we, at the United States today, still 
uh, has a steel industry which produces more than seven tons of steel. And it's because of um, technological change. The use of what is generally known of as automation to produce ingots and produced wire. I worked in a wire mill uh, that used to be produced largely by a combination of machines and hand. By the technological revolution in steel, the second technological revolution, the first one was in the 19th century, um, the, the um, basic oxygen process, which was an automated process, and other technological changes had, um, in, had reduced the number of steel workers from 600,000 to approximately 100,000. And that tells you the story, a story, but a major story of the American working class. It used to be that production workers were the majority of the working class in the United States. Uh, it no longer is the case. To give you a second example, uh, auto had 700,000 workers and never had much automation. It was largely a hand uh, assembled uh, car with, a, uh, with an assembly line as its main automation, but all of the parts were put by hand. I spent six months at a GM plant in Linden, New Jersey as a, as a, as a, car, as a car worker, because I was laid off from, from my plant in Harrison, New Jersey, which was a steel plant. And uh, it was a, a division of labor where you basically put in one part for eight hours a day into a succession of, of, of cars which were produced at a rate of 60 cars an hour for a GM car. It wasn't, it was the, uh, the Oldsmobile and the Pontiac and the Buick. No Chevrolet. Chevrolet was produced in near Buffalo, New York, uh, and still exists near Buffalo, New York, but much smaller than it was historically. Um, um, today, how many industrial workers, that, that uh, term meaning people who produce goods, you know, like cars and steel and uh, rubber and um, garments and textiles and, you know, how many of those still exist in the United States? First thing, how much is the uh, workforce? <laughs> take, take a rough guess. 140 million. How many? 140 million. 40 million? 140 million. He's talking about the, the entire employment. Well, that's the workforce. The industrial work. But not all of it is full time. Full time is considered by the Department of Labor today to be 28 uh, hours a week and more. And so a lot of companies now have full time workers with part time pay working 2,800 hours, uh, 28 hours a week and they get paid uh, time and a half for overtime, but they don't have a 40 hour week or a 35 hour week. The 28 hours are paid at, 20 hour, at, at straight time. Um, we have now 8 million industrial workers out of 140 million. Think of the percentage of industrial workers we have today. Still, There are 159,000 automobile workers in the union, and then there's a non-union sector which is growing, which probably has another 40,000 workers, non-union. 
um, that make everything from um, Mercedes Benz. The Mercedes Benz still sells the top rank at $60,000 a car. It's made in South Carolina as much as it is in Germany. Or Birmingham, too. Or Birmingham. Yeah, Alabama. There's a Birmingham yep. plant? Well, there's one in South Carolina, too. Uh, but but certainly uh, BMW and uh, Fiat, w which is now Fiat Chrysler, uh, um, and um, many of the Japanese Nissan uh, Mississippi. Cars. Yeah. What did you say? Nissan and Mississippi. Nissan and Mississippi, which is the largest car yeah. manufacturer, single plant with about five thousand, mostly black, and voted against the union in the last union election with the UAW. Because they're getting paid in Mississippi, not the union rate, but pretty close to it. The union rate is now about $32 an hour, and they're getting paid $25 an hour, which is much better than non-union workers in general make in the uh, South. So what strikes you about the Communist Manifesto? I'll, I'll, I'll wait for that in a minute. <clears throat> the other thing that happened with the reduction of the workforce is that some of the largest in, industrial workforce, is some of the largest um, industrial states in this union were no, became no longer industrial states in the uh, meaning of the term. It used to be it used to be the case that you could name anybody could name seven eight maybe ten industrial states that carried the bulk of all of the production that took place in this country. Textiles, of course, by 1960 had largely moved to the south. Garments by 1970, men's and women's wear, moved to the South, and then they moved overseas. Of course, the South became too hot. The textile workers were organizing in the South. But those seven or eight or ten states, depending on how you look, how you look at it, mostly were in the North, aside from the textile industry. All right, any idea what they might be? Pennsylvania. Right. Ohio. Ohio, Michigan. Pennsylvania. Michigan. Michigan. We only know two so far. Well, Michigan. Wisconsin. Needless to say, Michigan. If, I don't know. Pennsylvania if had the steel, in the large amount of the steel industry. Illinois no. had the next part yeah. of the steel industry and other industries. Um, I mean, I don't know if, if you consider California. mining California. What? If you consider mining industrial, then you well, throw in West Virginia. Yeah. Kentucky, 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 California, New Jersey, and New, Jersey. And New York. New York at one point, that is to say, traditionally, had the state 600,000 Garment workers, men's and women's garments. 600,000, the size of the steel industry was in New York State, in the garment industry, and ancillary in the textile industry. New Jersey. The electrical industry was heavily in New Jersey. Westinghouse, GE, where Westinghouse was in uh, Pennsylvania, had a big plant in Pennsylvania, a big plant in Newark. Needless to say, a big plant near in East Pittsburgh. Those are the main places where it produced uh, its product. General Electric was where? Biggest in electrical manufacturing a uh, company in the in the in the, uh, in the United States. Schenectady. Huh? Schenectady. Schenectady. 
that's a very good player. Well, that's, Schenectady is not in North Carolina, right? <laughs> it's in New York State. <coughs> Where else? Massachusetts. which was a tremendously large uh, manufacturing. It had um, uh, a big textile plant in where? Lawrence. Huh? Lawrence. Lawrence, Lawrence, Lawrence. Lawrence Massachusetts. Why do you know Lawrence, David? How do you know Lawrence? Just because you're <laughs> well informed? I thought it was pretty famous. I mean, they had... <laughs> 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 I, don't, I don't have inside information, but I'm 200 years old. Will, Will Chamberlain played basketball there. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. What happened in Lawrence? Well, there was this uh, strike in, I guess, 1911 or so. 12? Sorry. 12. It doesn't matter. I mean, you were it was a good guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, um, the big Lawrence, Massachusetts. Textile strike was in was was a, was a very large. It was it made basic textiles. It was there was still a northern textile industry, and there was a it was a major strike. Where else was there big textile plants aside from New York and uh, New York City and uh, New York New York City uh, and Massachusetts? Where else? I come from Rhode Island. Rhode Island is important. important. In textiles. Yeah, I'm, I matter of fact, my first jobs were in textile. But mm -hmm. they were really closing down. You know? yeah, I think there was a lot in New Jersey also. What? There was a lot in New Jersey also. A uh, textile? Absolutely. So. The Textile Workers Union of America had uh, at its height 400,000 members. And that was during the organizing period until about 1946 or 47. And of the 400,000, 100,000 were in New Jersey. The Union, but that, but the the industry was moving south, so that that was that time was uh, was limited. Um, the uh, by the time the textile workers merged with the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, how I was, they were less than. 75,000 members. There were probably around 50,000 members. With New Jersey and Pennsylvania being the largest part of the uh, Textile Workers Union, still uh, the rest of the country was de-industrialized. And the district office for the Textile Workers Union, which was the, the Textile Workers District was New York City, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland. That was the, that was the district. It had, you know, a, probably 125,000, 130,000 people, um, union people. Patterson was another large part of it, but it was mainly not, and earlier it had been silk. The great silk strike was 1913. And the uh, silk strike, which was in Patterson, not some textile, but mainly silk, became a famous strike. Does anybody, hello, Hi. does anybody know, is this going to be the time you'll be arriving every time? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Um, we had a guy in one of my classes. He was on time every time, about 1.15. He'd come to his 12 o'clock class. <laughs> <laughs> and Michael was in the class and we used to look at each other and laugh. <laughs> there was no way out of it. No matter what happened, he would come an hour and 45 minutes, an hour and a half, an hour and a quarter late. <laughs> Sometime walking in five or ten minutes before the class was over. Um, the, 
the fame of the Patterson textile strike was not so much in numbers. The fame of the Patterson textile uh, uh, silk strike was that the union Uh, with some journalistic help, uh, which we'll come to in a minute, uh, decided that the only way that they could win the strike was to win the public and, fr and, pr and, and prevent starvation. Because that might lead workers to want to go back to work because they weren't dating. Even though they raised money with the food collections and all that and money, uh, they moved the children to New York City so they would eat regular because the union was strong in New York and there were other unions with workers who were willing to take children on a temporary basis. Anybody know the name of uh, uh, of John, who was the um, the journalist who was part of the strike, not part of the reportage mostly. John Reed. You didn't see Warren Beatty I'll in the fame. John Reed. Huh? John, John Reed. Reed. John Reed. <coughs> That's right. And John Reed became the first president of the Communist Party of America. It was, it was not called the Communist Party. His, his party was called the Communist Workers' Party. There was a Communist Party as well, which was largely immigrants, and he was proud of the fact that the Communist Party of America was mostly either native-born or native English-speaking from Canada, from Britain, and so on. It was a wildly successful strike because it, it organized around the children. And with characteristic um, blindness, the, the, the labor movement has now had over a century of ignoring the Patterson textile strike and its um, tactics. It doesn't not only occupy as in Flint in 1937 when the GM number four, when the body shop was occupied by the workers and the GM companies uh, collapsed and, and, gay, and organized the industry with the, with the union as a whole, every plant in the GM um, chain was brought into the union as a result of the Flint set-down strike. It was an amazing uh, uh, event. And as a result, the UAW, which was built on Chrysler, Ford, and GM, had a major weak sector, GM, because it was a company union. And if you but it was not only a company union, but it was a union in which the company gave nothing except um, affirmative action for ass lickers. Always. You could become a foreman, you could become a manager, you could, you could become a highly skilled worker and they'll pay your, uh, your, uh, your, your school. That was a GM. I don't think it's the same anymore. They don't have to do anything have. anymore. <laughs> One third. The fucking union One is, so the weak, is so weak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to introduce this uh, course by asking a question. What is, what is, what is the left, uh, what is a leftist? 
What do you have to be to be a leftist in America? Or virtually anywhere. I didn't hear that. This is the name of the course. You must have come to do some of this. What is your question? I didn't quite hear it. You didn't hear my question? What is? <laughs> what What is the left, and or what is what does it mean to be a leftist? Oh. What do you believe? Okay. If you're a leftist, and who are and who are the leftists that we know? <laughs> who have any public? Presence. Certainly not the president of the PSC. I'm sorry. I said uh, certainly not, not the president. Friend. The president uh, of the oh, PSC. Barbara? Yeah. <laughs> Barbara's a very very good Renaissance literature historian. You know she's very good. Yeah. And we selected her to run for president because she was a very good historian and she had a minimum of, uh, of uh, militancy at the time that we thought would be attractive to English teachers, which are the min a, a large minority of the, uh, of the teaching force, very large minority. They're not a majority, but they are very large. I mean, I, I'm not going to answer your question directly, but I think one of the confusions is that, I'm not gonna answer that you in, the, <laughs> in the media. He should be the president. Oracle <laughs> 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 skills. <laughs> but what you would no. do is that you said, I'm not going to answer the question. But I might the question. You wouldn't answer it. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to beg it now. No, it's just like that. In, in, the, in the media, which, you know, unfortunately shapes so much of our thinking. The term leftist is used in a very, I don't know, kind of shallow and not, not informed way, so that what becomes identified as being left in the broad context of U.S. politics doesn't even notice is what's Bernie really Sanders on the left. Is a, a leftist? Well, that I mean, he would be the sort of. To the right of Robespierre. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he sits in the middle of the assembly. Well, in, in, in the Senate, he's on the left, but yes. that's... But in that's terms of the original term, exactly. left and right, right, it's my understanding, I may be wrong, but that this the National Assembly in Paris, you know, after right. the exactly. revolution, the left wing was set aside to the left, Robespierre, Saint-Just, Camille Desmoulin, et cetera, et cetera. And the Girondas, the reactionaries, were on the right to the principles of freedom, equality, and fraternity. And nobody remembers who Marat was, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Marat, M-A-R-A-T? Marat, I said Marat, so, yeah. yeah. You do remember? I remember more from the play and the play, well, listen, plays and the, and have a painting, function and the in history, right. historiography. The play is by, uh, by a very great Swiss playwright and novelist, Peter Weiss, W-E-I-S-S. And it's about Marat and his followers and the main song, or at least one of the main songs of the, um, Marat is, a, uh, is an ultra-leftist in, uh, in, the, in, the in, in the French context. He was well known and he was uh, jailed and so on, you know, but uh, so there's a chorus that sings at one point, Marat, we're poor, and the poor stay poor. Marat, don't make us wait anymore. We want our rights, and we don't care how. We want our revolution now. 
that's the and, and it's sung in a uh, in a very uh, uh, a, a, a very mournful way. My rock we're poor and the poor stay poor. My rock don't make us wait anymore. See like that. Um, and there are happy songs when they're making the revolution, or at least the prelude to the revolution. And, this, and the uh, music follows that, and it's uh, much faster. And I was well, you, and you saw them. You saw the play. I think I saw the play. You think a long you saw time it? Ago. I have an image in my mind, but I don't really remember that clearly. Well, well, it played in New, New York. York. I'm pretty sure I saw it. And it played to full houses, but not on Broadway. Needless to say, such a uh, production would not play on Broadway in the 60s. As performed by the inmates of the asylum. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Is Bernie Sanders a, a leftist? For the couple of times that we live in, yeah. I'm sorry? I said if you were to say <coughs> relative to, it's, 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 to me I see it as kind of a relative term. Uh, and relative to what's currently no, available, yeah. But, uh, you know, um, it's, um, if, you, if, you, if you have a particular definition, you might find it, you know, it doesn't meet necessarily the standards. But, I've always felt that a person on the left is an individual, in the end, who stands in solidarity with individuals that are less advantaged um, by the uh, existing social and political system. Which would mean that a leftist could be someone, in your opinion, who takes for granted the existing capitalist order as the context within which all politics that they would participate or could participate uh, exists. If, if you're living right now, uh, it, it uh, exists uh, as it exists. I mean, as, as a kind of a, let's say you're trying to imagine a ultimate best working society that you could still envision anything. Uh, um, but, you know, when, when I think of uh, functioning as a leftist in America today, you know, it has to be within within that capitalistic system. Now, you might be moving uh, toward a system of, of possibly altering and abolishing such system, you know, by replacing it with something that's either um, less competitively capitalistic or maybe even uh, more uh, socialistic. Yeah, more socialistic. But, right. Socialism I, is then a uh, a uh, a ladder of some kind, right? It's kind of a gradation. It's like a gradation. Kind of, yeah, I, I, yeah. You know, I mean, up on that. You don't have any uh, recordings of this uh, class here, where we're. Yeah. <laughs> no one is taking the class. <laughs> it, it is because yeah, yeah, your yeah, yeah, image is not on there, but your voice will be. Nobody will see it on camera up there. Yeah, he has a little camera on his chest. What? What? My litmus test for a real leftist. You know, I'm I'm outside of the uh, social context that um, Roy is talking about of our time. Is one who would consider the moral justification of assassinations. You know. I'm thinking in terms of uh, Camus in his book, The Rebel, um, writes about the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, they were called the fastidious assassins of, of 1905, and he presents a, a justification for assassination of political figures, you know, so I think of um, um, Che Guevara, you know, I, and I think that's, is coming to be the real question, it's, 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 it's certainly an existential question. But I don't think Bernie or anybody else that's in the news lately 
goes quite that far. It would, it would, it would kind of be dangerous to you know what Bernie have said an when academic he was discussion asked, of that. What does it mean to be a socialist today? <laughs> you know what he said? It, it means to be for um, improved health care, unemployment insurance, a better housing, public housing program. And he went on to talk about one or two other entirely um, internal things to capitalist uh, uh, politics. I mean, Bernie, Bernie's the same. Bernie's as much of a socialist as uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a socialist. Well, that, his whole program is basically slightly to the right of Roosevelt's. Yeah, yeah exactly. 1935. Um, it's a New Deal program. When you ask the Greens or you ask the Bernies, what is you know, what are you for? It turns out basically they're for the return to a, a better New Deal. Yeah. yeah. So a, a few things come to mind as you're talking. I mean, one is I think the socialism represented by Bernie Sanders or Alexandria Andrea Casio Cortez really comes out of kind of Michael Harrington, I think he defined Michael Harrington was as combative? No, 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 I didn't say combative. <laughs> so oh. it came, it came, came out, out of, of came out that of his, out of DS, I think right. he basically, I, if I'm getting the phrase right, said, you know, the left wing of the possible. Yes. That was sort of his... I that, think that's a very good yeah, definition sort of, of the real yeah. uh, meaning of socialism for uh, many, many people, yeah. the left wing the of left the possible. Wing of the possible. But and how do you know what the possible well is? Well, that's right. And the possible <laughs> means accepting the basic structures, <coughs> economic, political, as they are, and just trying to be as, you know, humanistic and, and fighting for equality within those parameters. Um, but I think, I guess what, you know, seems to me the big one of the big questions is that what had been <coughs> the left pre you know the collapse of the Soviet Union had at least other things to point to which of course are hugely problematic but there is no credible vision of something outside the system that people can believe is at all possible. And that's, I think that's one of the real well, dilemmas of the left. We're going to have a very interesting time here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of disagree with that. I mean, I honestly think that, you know, actually existing socialism in many ways was sort of a state capitalism. Yeah, no, for sure. No, he's not, he's not, dis he's not, dis he's, he's, he's not, not a part of the union. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it lost its credibility long <laughs> before the Soviet Union <laughs> collapsed. <laughs> but that, that was, that gave people who define themselves as leftists a sense that there were other possible kinds of societies. And the failure of those attempts With leaves, very, very leaves a real vacuum in, in alternative. Can you forms. imagine Leon Trotsky calling the Soviet Union a degenerate worker state? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, this is Leon, this is Leon Trotsky. I have Trotsky's Trotsky friends who still <laughs> use that still term. That. <laughs> 1938. But it raises, I mean, this is a very good point that 1989 also marks as you know, philosophically, the end of history hypothesis of Fukuyama, and on the other hand, the Huntington thesis that we're now witnessing a global class of civilizations. And these two moments sort of replaced, if you will, this, you know, the yeah. Soviet Union as a marker, masthead, that another, you know, world was possible. Of course, the, the, you know, the Tina syndrome started to emerge with Thatcher Reaganism. So all of these things are converging that produce and condition a new type of thinking about the lack of, which you point out, the dilemma of an alternative 
I think this is very important to keep in mind. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's interesting. I'm reading uh, Sylvia Federici's uh, the, new the New Enclosures, <laughs> and uh, you know, re it, it, well, it's it's a collection of stuff from different times. You know, the reimagining. Um, what is it? I'm, I'm horrible with names. Um, the uh, but anyway, the point is is that she she actually says that because the you know the it, the third world liberation struggles were one of their big calls was a forgiveness uh, that that the debt was holding back their development, <laughs> and <laughs> she said. That, and she said they, they really got that from Marx. And she disagrees with that. <laughs> <laughs> you abolished it then. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's it. That's, that's, that's and the money demand. system. <laughs> yeah. The problem is, among the problems are, that if you, when you read for next week, the communist mani the manifesto of the Communist Party, which is only 60 pages or so, when you read that, the problem that you have to ask is whether it is no longer the case or is still the case that what you said, uh, that you cannot make evaluations of ideas in a vacuum. You have to take them in the context within which they have been uttered and developed, right? And, and the, the context is what? That's the first problem. What is the context? Is it a stable capitalism, a capitalism in crisis? A post-capitalist society. I'm not. I'm not uh, asking you to resolve that. I'm asking you to think it in the think the question in the context of of where we are today. If it, if you if you are orthodox in some ways, Marxist, which Michael Harrington thought of himself as. You look at the context and you adapt your program to the context. You adapt your form of organization to the context. You may, as he did, admire Lenin, but say, we are not in pre-Bolshevik Russia. We are in a, an advanced capitalist society that shows no signs of collapse. And therefore, we have to adapt our <coughs> we have to adapt our program to the realities of our own situation, which is what he says in his book on socialism, called Socialism, um, and which most people take for granted. Um, but the other problem that we will discover is that um, the proletariat, as Marx and Engels define it, in the first chapter, the proletariat is no longer hegemonic uh, either politically or in terms of its economic significance, it is at least problematic. It is certainly part of the system and what it produces and how it produces it, but it's become a fraction of what it was even in 1848 in England. This was written in 1847, this, uh, <coughs> this manifesto, and published February 1848. Um, do, we, do we water down uh, and hierarchize, if you want, socialism in relation to a society that may be uh, argued is not about the collapse in its fundamental uh, presuppositions, that is, 
production for profit, however you define profit for the moment, or do you hold to a revolutionary politic as a specter which haunts the, still haunts the world? Now remember, 1847, the specter is haunting Europe. The spe specter haunts in Europe, the specter of communism. That is the first line of the co a manifesto of the Communist Party. The, the, the second thing to note is it was called the Communist Party. What is the Communist Party? The, uh, the, uh, the real uh, estate holding on 23rd Street. We should have had more of no, 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 no. <laughs> The Communist Party is a building called a red building on Houston Street. I know my Communist Party. <laughs> 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 oh, I mean, these are, these are not insignificant. So if you really wanted to make a change, do you think that uh, uh, Sanders' move from being an independent socialist to becoming a Democrat, which is what he is in, for all intents and purposes, the socialism is at best rhetorical and at worst wrong, and that is to say it has no basis, even what he has. Uh, if you're going to be doing something else, what would you be doing in this, in this situation? Do you, I mean, the problem of context does not get lost if you acknowledge that we are in a world system which is dominated by leading capitalist interests, which are not always uh, geographically based. Um, but it requires some thought. There's no doctrine that can be handed down hierarchically w with the most elementary uh, components starting and then we move up the, uh, the hierarchy to the point at which we have, uh, we want our revolution now and it takes, all it takes is what? The other problem that, that, is, um, that, that is suggested by the, the title is the question of the party. What is the party? Is the party always a democratic centralist party as the Communist Party uh, uh, and Communist International, which was not, not the least democratic? Um, or is it something else? Or is it the, the old Leninist Party, uh, misinterpreted by most of the current Leninists? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined after we read the manifesto, to take a look at one of his writings in which he's, uh, he says that he is for democracy, but we are in an unusual situation, namely czarism and uh, the Russian crisis. But we can, we can take that for granted, he said that. Uh, and what does that mean? Uh, but uh, here you have now a, a, a following situation. The British Communist Party exists, but like the American Communist Party, it exists uh, with membership which, it, which includes um, the graveyard, but does not call itself communist anymore. The American Communist Party does call itself communist, but it does have a very large membership in the graveyard. And I mean literally. Um, then you have the French Communist Party, which has now been reduced to about 1% of the uh, electorate because it's chosen, chosen to be an electoral party, a party that contests seats in the French parliament. You have a um, German uh, Communist Party which has got 9% of the vote, rain or shine, and doesn't change. Um, and generally speaking, 
uh, as a couple of prominent intellectuals and artists, but and and has classes on capital. Does um, Th three hundred study groups. Three hundred study groups, but still gets nine percent of the vote, but puts its money into the vote. And the. Um, Communist parties of Latin America, which have been to a large extent uh, devolved into guerrilla movements, or have joined de facto as the f as the French and the uh, Germans and the Italians have joined de facto in parliamentary socialism. There are always individual exceptions, like Cuba. Uh, to give you one example, uh, but this is a, this is a serious issue. I, I wrote in 1912 published uh, in Columbia University Press a book on C. Wright Mills. Mills said he never voted. He also said that he was a plain Marxist as a word of his, and he was a goddamn anarchist, an anarchist Marxist. And, and yet, in 19, if you said in 1958, who was among the most influential intellectuals in the United States, Mills would be at least one of ten, maybe more, maybe less, maybe one of five. Um, I never won on a demonstration. He was not that kind of intellectual. Was he an activist? Was he a, 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 a political, a political significance and so on? Those are important. Those are important questions. And now we have a program which runs at six o'clock, Monday through Friday on. CUNY TV, uh, CUNY TV and during the morning on BAI, huh? Eight o'clock, yeah. Eight o'clock on BAI? Yeah. Um, and then on free speech yeah, at midnight. We have Amy Goodman, who invites um, Glenn Greenwald Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and uh, <laughs> Chomsky, and once Chomsky a month, and then Tuesday and Thursday, <laughs> and, once a month. and I have listened to a number of Chomsky and Greenwald interviews. And I have not been able to discern, except for Greenwald, every now and then, a single idea, aside from a, descrip a description, that emanates from their mouths and their cold letters. Chomsky, is, Chomsky describes horrible th the horrors. And Greenwald sometimes has something to say but rarely. Amy just says he is a Pulitzer Prize winner <laughs> and a famous journalist, and she has him on all the time. Uh, that's the left. That is a left, anyway. Um, Chomsky's a great um, linguist. I read his work on, on language. It is extremely smart. I don't agree with the, th the main thesis uh, necessarily, but it is beautifully argued, and he knows what he's doing and has nothing in it but judgments of his opponents, uh, of his friends, and so on. But when Chomsky goes on about capitalist um, horrors, it's all descriptive. I guess he thinks he doesn't have to have any ideas anymore. He's uh, 90 years old and a very revered figure, but doesn't take the um, luxury of polemic. He doesn't have polemic. Any political uh, figure, whether it be in an interview with an individual in an apartment house or on television, any leftist of whatever kind we can talk about would have to have a polemic because you have to distinguish yourself from your enemies and some of your friends. 
And as Chomsky said, fairly recently, those who do not have enemies are not political. And if you don't know your enemies, that's even worse. Stanley, what of, what of his uh, linguistic theory did you disagree with, or would you? Um, he doesn't have a conception. He has a genetic conception of, of, uh, of everything. That is to say, the, uh, the world as we, the everyday world within which we lived, and the structures of society, which are the larger context, are not in his linguistics. Mm -hmm. His best statement is that um, everybody, with certain exceptions, who is uh, destined to live a, a, a normal life has the capacity for transforming grammar. That's the uh, that's the uh, that's a very profound statement if you understand who he's opposed to. But he has a genetic theory of intelligence and a genetic theory of articulation. I don't have a genetic. I I don't believe in the gen. I'm not a, an advocate of the genetic theory. I think people are formed in contexts over which they have relatively little control and respond sometimes in extraordinarily um, appropriate ways. And others who have the same context don't, don't have any uh, ideas much, but they do follow people who do because they recognize that, that, that there's truth there, oh, but they don't know why that they think it's because Chomsky is a genius, that he is a great linguist. Chomsky started out as a left-wing Zionist. Okay. Did you know that? He was a member of the Hashem Merhatzayir, he went and tried to live on a um, kibbutz, a collective farm. He was at, at the Hashem Mahatzayir, were people who were uh, pro-communist, pro but were cheating on the dues. They uh, adopted Zionism, as in many ways, as a um, <coughs> convenience to allow themselves to have an, a, a, a public presence in a social democratic Israel that, that was in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And now no longer exists as far as I can tell except as an annual dinner. Well, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. I was invited to be the keynote speaker to the annual convention of a non-Zionist Jewish leftist organization. I uh, encountered a, a, a mess of people, a thousand people. And I made a speech that they all thought was great because they invited me, you know, I had to say something. <laughs> <laughs> um, he didn't say anything was going to piss them off. What? <laughs> well, no. They were the they were they were the people who who were the uh, the um, uh, the Jewish leftists who made a Jewish revolution in Russia, in parts of Russia. They did not ex uh, intend to keep it Jewish forever, but they thought they could not organized the Jewish uh, working class, which was majority of the Eastern European Jews. They couldn't organize the Jewish working class without being Jewish in their name. And uh, they didn't, but they were anti-Zionist. They were, they were for staying in Russia, but they were not allowed to stay by a number of circumstances, among which was uh, the, 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 the Bolsheviks themselves, also the Tsars. And they left during the Tsarist period, they left after 1905, which was my, great, my, my, my grandfather on my mother's side. 
he died. He came over in 1907 or 1908. My mother was born in 1913. Um, but he was a uh, he was a, a socialist, you know, and a, and a revolutionary socialist, who was a member of this Jewish organization and a member of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers because he was he was superb uh, cutter. I'm writing my memoir. I've written two chapters of my memoir, and I and I'm writing about my early life. And it's not an autobiography, but I had to write about my, my grandfather. My grandfather used to make for me, at the age of seven and eight, suits himself. He made a whole suit himself, needle and thread, and old-fashioned sewing machine. He was a real craftsperson. They couldn't touch him, because he was, you know, he was, he, and they wouldn't touch him because um, even though Dubinsky and uh, Sidney Hillman were profoundly anti-revolutionary uh, by the 1940s, they were not um, um, as my president Trump says, witch hunters. They were not. The Communist Party had a faction in Local 22 of the Garment Workers Union through the 1960s, which got 20% of the vote, year after year, they were like the German Communist Party. <laughs> Stagnation never phased them, <laughs> or, or caused them to rethink. 20%, that's a lot of people. That, that local had about 30,000 members. So they had a, you know, they, they had a vote of 6,000 members, right? That's a lot of votes. But what Dubinsky and Sasha Zimmerman, Charles Zimmerman, who had been a communist in the great 1926 strike, which, got, which was a law strike, he was a communist. He was the president of Local 22. They lost the, uh, the, the general strike in, in, um, in dresses. The, that's where I started, got lost, but by the, by the 40s and 50s, he was a, um, he was a, a, a Dubinskyite, but, but a critical Dubinskyite. Um, what he knew to do was to isolate the communists, not to, not to destroy them, to isolate them. They had shops, they had, you know, they didn't just have boats at the uh, local level, they, they had shop chairs, and I met some of them actually, um, but they didn't go anywhere. And, they, and he was uh, he was always uh, he always attacked them for various reasons and kept them separate from everybody else. Now Ruther didn't do that with the uh, American communists, who were very powerful. Ruther did two things. One, he was a red baiter, and he was a collaborator with the CIA. The most dangerous man in Detroit is what Nelson Lichtenstein called him. He was not a dangerous man in the real sense of the world. Uh, but, he, uh, but, but where he couldn't make any real headway, as in Local 600, which is the Ford Local, which had 120,000 people at one point, but 60,000 after the war, he left them completely alone. He never touched them. He never went and, and fought them on their own ground. But a lot of other places, he fought very hard and destroyed the Communist Party. But that wasn't the. Uh, the but neither Hillman nor uh, nor uh, Dubinsky were into that ki that kind of uh, combat. That kind of uh, combat is unknown. To, to the leftists, and unknown to the social democrats, unknown to the liberals, unknown to anybody. And I suppose that the way you would have to find it again would be to find somebody in Yiddish and somebody in Italian to look at the archive. 
because the archive is a pretty big one, I'm told. But you have to know Yiddish, because none of it was written in English. Yeah. <laughs> there were no Americans in that local. <laughs> in which local? Local 22. Of the I met Zinnemann when he was an old man already, which was 1960s. <coughs> and I'm a pretty good interviewer. I sat down with him, and he told me for about seven hours <coughs> into the night over uh, whiskey, the story of how he kept the communists at bay and didn't believe, did believe in, uh, in civil liberties but did not believe in uh, towering to the enemy, you know. He denounced them all the time. But did not apply um, no communist clauses to the Constitution, as did the, um, the auto workers, for example. Would you say, I mean, this because some of my family history goes back to there, too, were the communists in the, in the different textile unions, did they have a more militant politics? What, what were the, the kind of issues were, that in split textile, them from the, the communists socialists? Were not you don't mean textile, you mean garment. In the garment. Yeah. Well, they, they had locals in but New York. Right. They had members everywhere else, and they had a lot of, lo a lot of shops in New England. But they were they, in terms of policy differences as opposed to just party affiliation differences. But were there, were there, was, were they more the militant? It was, was on a shop by shop level, but also the contract. <coughs> they were against the, fr the, the frozen contract that, that the Social Democrats negotiated several occasions, or the very low pay. They were, they were for more defense of people who were fired. The, so there was a more military. The, the ILG, by the way, degenerated into an out and out company union in New York. Out and out. Except for the dress strike of 1926 and the dress strike of 1958. They suddenly came to life and then died again, you know. Um, the clothing workers were different. Louis Monstock, who was the head of the um, clothing workers joint board, was a very uh, militant trade unionist on issues especially of discharge and uh, bosses cheating workers on pay because it was all, you know, it was peaceful. And uh, he fought hard. And some people said he fought so hard that they had to leave, the industry had to leave. <laughs> you know, is that sort of issue. The ILG would not let the industry leave if it could help it, so it act, and, and its space was be, became Chinatown. And, in, and what it did is it made a deal with the Chinatown bosses, some of which were Chinese, most of which were not, that in return for full health benefits, the health benefits uh, of the ILG were very good, they would permit the bosses to hire and pay people belong to minimum wage. We exposed them. In 1964, 65. And they, they admitted it. And they said, most of these families need, need health benefits. They don't need higher wages because everybody in the family is working. Even teenagers, you know. Yeah, they were doing that into the 90s. What? They were doing that into the 90s. Yeah, sure. There were still members of the union in Chinatown sure. in the 90s yeah. who were making $5, $4 an hour. Yeah. Yeah, no, I had an intern. She worked with her mother at a sewing factory. You had what? She worked with her mother at a sewing factory, a high school intern. Okay. Yeah. Mm. All right, next week, please read the manifesto, and I will have a list of, re of, of, of readings. Okay. 
okay, I know how many copies to break. Uh, I'll see when I think I can't be here next week. You can't be here yeah. next week. Oh, you'll get it fired on you. Um, is that edition of left turn? If you give me your, if we give me your, it's only one edition. If you give me your, I see you have the hard copy. It's the same edition. It's the same edition. Next week. I think I have it's the only manifesto one edition. at home. Well, I, I think I have the manifesto at home. Two thousand. You know, I don't mean I the manifesto. Five. You mean five? Yeah. five. Yeah. Okay. I mean for the following week. Right. No, okay. no. Yeah, that's fine. No, yeah. you're not. Can't be here next week. Mm -hmm. It's the, the following week we probably will, we, we might or might still be on the manifesto. You'll be surprised at the manifesto once you read it again. Hmm. Nobody on the so-called left is a leftist, in, in, according to Marx and Engels. <laughs> in, in 1847. <laughs> you know, the, right. the, uh, this friend of mine is teaching a class in the, uh, in the class is a, their textbook has uh, the communist part of the communist manifesto. I don't believe in that, really. Yeah, <laughs> but they don't call it the communist manifesto. It is not. It's not the real t term for the communist manifesto. They call it the class struggle yeah, manifesto. Uh, well, that's all right. Yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, the proper term is the manifesto of the communist party. Right. It's about a party formation. It's not about you know. What communism is. So it's pretty party close to the what they mean by what, what they mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I was going to pass around uh, an email list uh, for people, please, so we can put you on. There. And the website is, um, um, if you want to take this down, radicalimagination.institute. And the readings uh, will go up there on PDF form. I, I don't know if left turn. It's possible to do that. I'm through our Russian affiliates, we probably can get this. We'll see. Yeah, but anyway, the, the, yeah. This is uh, this yeah. is still in yeah. print, but yeah. I have yeah. bad news. It's thirty nine dollars new, but they have um, used copies in paperback. In paperback. Wow. Elizabeth has a hard cover. And it's cheaper. But I'll have a list for next week. <laughs> <laughs>